Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I'm thrilled to be with you here this afternoon for the first of our spring seminar series, discussions on the theme of appetite. Uh, my name is Ivy Ken. I'm a sociologist here at GW, and along with a multidisciplinary group of faculty from GW's Urban Food Task Force, and with the support of the Office of the Provost, the Office of the Vice President for Research, the Columbian College of Arts and Sciences, and the Department of Sociology. We have organized programming this spring around this theme of appetite. Uh, the topic of appetite really interested many of us because it sits at the nexus of so many disciplinary perspectives from medicine and biology and physiology to uh, philosophy and sociology and geography. In my first ever sociology course in 1989, our professor Joel Sharon made this very provocative assertion. There is, he said, no such thing as human nature. <laughs> and then he repeated this over and over again to make sure it was knocked into our heads. But there was one possible exception he was willing to make. And that had to do with a baby's first moments of life. So when a baby comes out of the womb, he said, she knows she's hungry. And because of thousands of years of evolutionary change, her body knows how to satisfy her appetite. He said, we have a human instinct for suckling. But beyond the first moment when the infant makes contact with the food or the source of food, then it's all over, it's all social. Now, I think our thinking about the social nature of human beings in the world has come a long way since 1989, but this example reveals that even uh, the most staunch uh, supporter or observer of the social influences on our life, lives is willing to acknowledge that appetite has some basis in our bodies. And at the same time, uh, the most passionate researcher on the physiological or the biological um, imperative of hunger is probably also willing to acknowledge that that appetite or that hunger exists within social contexts. The guest we've invited to campus here today, Amy Bentley, is Associate Professor of Nutrition, Food Studies, and Public Health at New York University. Uh, Bentley has served as the President of the Association for the Study of Food and Society. She is currently an editorial board member of the journals Food and Foodways and Food, Culture, and Society. Professor Bentley has written on food-related topics as varied as victory gardens to food riots, um, from Martha Stewart's cuisine to the topic of hers that I think I'm in love with the most, one word, deliciousness. Um, and Professor Bentley takes on this topic of appetite in a really interesting way. She is able to reveal through her work the way our tastes as a culture uh, change and sh are shaped over time at the same time that our tastes as individuals change and are shaped over time. So if we as a culture are fed commercial food that includes ingredients that may or may not be included in the fruit that drops from the tree a mile away, that affects our tastes as a culture. And as an individual, if a baby is fed food that has been commercially prepared and that may or may not include ingredients that would, would come in a more natural source of that food. That affects his or her taste over time. So she takes on the industrialization of taste through this fascinating vehicle of baby food. Um, so I hope you'll join me in welcoming for a delicious morsel of scholarship, our friend Amy Bentley. Thank 
Thank you, Ivy, for that lovely introduction. I don't think I've had such a nice introduction ever in my life. Really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you. Thanks for the members of the um, George Washington Food Consortium and all of you in the audience who have come today. I really appreciate being invited and hope that we'll have a, a good discussion after my presentation. Um, I've, I've told some of you I've been interested in this topic for a long time, about 17 years, when my son was a baby and I dutifully read all of the books and I was uh, you know, over-educated member of the middle class who you know, read everything and wanted to do everything right and um, wait, waited for the right moment when the book said it was time for solid food and, and at that point went to the grocery store, probably earlier than that, but went to the grocery store and um, for the first time kind of really looked and saw this aisle of baby food products and kind of looked at this incredible variety and packaging and images and aesthetics and products and all the accoutrements that go with the products, the sippy cups and the pacifiers and the bottles and the, and it, I thought, wow, this is a whole culture in and of itself. And I picked up a little jar of applesauce and I, um, Looked at it, had a little smiley baby on the front, and I, I looked at the ingredients and it said apples, water, vitamin C. And then I looked at the price. I can't remember what the price was. And I thought, hmm, that's, that's, those are the same ingredients probably as in a conventional bigger jar of applesauce. And I remember, maybe I didn't do this, but I, I would like to think I did this at that, that moment, but I, went, I know I did it later. I went over to the the jar, the applesauce aisle with the regular applesauce and I looked at the big, bigger jar of applesauce and it contained apples, water, citric acid for vitamin C and I looked at the price and the little jar which was much cuter and had a lovely aesthetic and a beautiful label was a, you know, at least double the price of the bigger one and I thought, wow, this something is going on. There's just, we have, we have commodified this product and kind of invented it, that this idea of baby food really struck me as, as so interesting and has become such a rite of passage and such a part of mainstream American culture. And <clears throat> I was intrigued enough to um, want to study it professionally and, and it's been this very long project that's it's been 17 years, but I've enjoyed it um, immensely and I'm now kind of at the end stages where I'm wrapping it up and trying to turn it into the publisher um, as a, uh, to be published as a book. Um, to give you some idea, I, what I, I focus on a couple things: the, the 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 invention and creation of of baby food, and then its effects on Americans in, and how it builds and creates um, itself, and then also how it affects um, infant consumption habits, and it does dramatically. So, just to give you a snapshot of this change in about a half a century. Um, first snapshot, an advice manual from the late 19th century, a household manual that had advice on everything from you know, how to kill bugs to how to um, get stains out to how to feed your baby. And the advice and the practice, as far as I can gather, was for you know, overall overwhelming breastfeeding um, and the introduction of solid, solid food late in the first year with fruits and vegetables introduced even later in the second year, usually after the summer is over. So um, by current standards, a very late introduction of solid foods. For those of you who aren't up on all of this, and I don't expect you to be, the current uh, medical advice is um, predominantly bre you know, breastfeeding and um, and introduction of solids between four and six months of age, when an infant is between four and six months of age. It's thought that that's when the body is physiologically ready for the introduction of solid foods. So fast forward to the 1920s, and between um, the late 19th century and the early 20s, you have a, a concerted introduction of infant formula, artificial formulas, and bottle feeding. And you get more of that as part of the practice. Breastfeeding is still probably predominant, but there's more and more bottle feeding of um, formula or milk um, concoctions, cow's milk concoctions. And the introduction of solids has dropped to between six to eight months of age. Um, and then also, since vitamins had been discovered by then, there's a practice of introducing tiny amounts of cod level 
liver oil, and orange juice um, to, for the additions of vitamins. So uh, orange juice obviously is for vitamin C. Does anyone know what cod liver oil contains? D, exactly. So this is before milk is fortified, and so cod liver oil is the form of vitamin D. And then you fast forward to after World War II, the 1950s and 60s, kind of the golden age of infant, uh, commercial infant food, when you have predominantly bo bottle feeding um, with formula and the introduction of solids between four to six weeks. And it's usually often before that. So um, before the child is one month of age, the solids are being introduced into the diet. Diet. So in the space of a, a roughly 50 years, you have this dramatic drop in um, the introduction of solids and the shift from breast to bottle feeding. So from, from breastfeeding to late introduction of solids to the shift in um, predominantly bottle feeding and early introduction of solids. And I think that's what I wanted to explore. I wanted to explore this transition and what, what went into it, what were the elements, and what were the effects of the, um, the shift. Now I need to look at my notes here. Okay, so, and, then, and I'm looking at this category and this invention of baby food. Previous, uh, prior to the late 19th century, there wasn't really a category of baby food. There was a category of soft foods, kind of foods that were similar for, um, for infants, also invalids and sick people. So they tended to be the forms of gruel, um, pap or pablum, they called it, or beef broth, beef juice, they, uh, scraped beef, which were just were very very finely um, minced um, beef, beef, and um, that was fed to an infant or someone who's sick or someone who was old and didn't necessarily have teeth or could chew properly. The invention of baby food is a confluence of a few factors, and the first is the discovery and promotion of vitamins in the early teens. Finally, scientists had isolated these um, elements that were found to be really important in the diet. And prior to then, they knew that there were elements and mineral salts. They would kind of call them different things, but didn't really know quite where they came from and what, why they were important. But when they did, it was all of a sudden fruits and vegetables took on a different level of importance. Prior to the invention of vitamins, they were seen as you know nice but not the strength and health producing foods that wheat based products, grain based products and meat based products were. Um, afterwards, there was seen to be really real value and import in fruits and vegetables. And you can imagine then it began to become more important to feed children fruits and vegetables. Of course, another big one is the medicalization of infancy and childhood. And the early 20th century is when um, uh, medical associations are being formed. The, 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 pra uh, the practice of pediatricians is developing. More women are giving birth in hospitals and less, uh, fewer, less use of midwives. Um, there's a medicalization of childbirth and also infant feeding where um, the professionals kind of take over and women um, lose confidence, if not control, of, of the process. Changing philosophies of child rearing also make a difference in this story of the shift in infant feeding patterns. In the early 20th century, you um, had advice manuals and practice that was very much influenced by behaviorism. So you had Watson, um, don't pick up a baby. If it's crying, you will spoil it. Um, to toilet train rigidly, feed rigidly, you know, everything on a schedule, um, everything exact and measured. And you have that shift to a post-war um, Spockian, more child-centered form of infant feeding and, and, and infant rearing. So if a child cries, maybe it wants to be picked up. Maybe it's not a bad idea to pick up your child and comfort it. Maybe you should take cues from your child about when um, he or she wants to eat. And you know, kind of more intuitive and more um, trusting, actually, of the parents' instincts as well. You have a, a, a real industrialization of the food supply in the early 20th century. So not just as baby food being developed, but industrially processed food is being de developed across the board, mass production of food in nearly every sector. And then as we get into the post-World War period, what really, uh, I think, makes a difference in this story is this post-war 
um, cultural climate of American exceptionalism. This idea of, Mer of the United States as, as a superpower, as modern, as strong, as um, not dependent on old folk methods or folk theory, and that we can feed our babies baby food because we're wealthy and we have the means, and it's more scientific um, and less primitive. And then in this early period, there's not real conclusive medical evidence about whether it's harmful or helpful to feed a child um, solids or at an early age. So doctors aren't really quite sure, you know, if it's all that bad to feed a week old infant solids. You know, maybe it's it's a good thing. So that in uh, that inconclusivity makes also um, a, an important element in this story. And then finally, advertising and marketing, which as the industrialization of the food supply is going, so is advertising, marketing of products, um, persuading a public through various and frequent means, through media, print, um, the employment of doctors and dietitians to promote, um, uh, to promote products. And that's always also instrumental. And then just to sum up my kind of overall um, emphasis is, is I'm trying to show how baby food is an invented product as a result of all these factors. Um, it becomes very, very popular and still is because of its convenience. And it has an element of modernity that gives it um, uh, credence and it kind of lends it legitimacy in uh, as a form of food as a as a form of food for your baby it's also um, the, the story of, of this, this story of baby food is the result of um, the need for more fruits and vegetables in a diet um, and then and that canned food commercial food provides a year-round um, supply and then also as solids are fed earlier and earlier, it, it also leads to the displacement of breastfeeding in addition to formula feeding. So um, researchers have written a lot and talked a lot about how formula levels go up and breastfeeding goes down. I mean, we kind of know that story pretty well. The decline of breastfeeding matches the rise of formula feeding, bottle feeding. But what I'm also trying to show is that part of that shift is this insertion of solid food into the infant's diet at earlier and earlier ages. So solid food is also essentially displacing breastfeeding in terms of just sheer amounts of food going into an infant's stomach. Um, and then also, this early introduction of not just solid food, but also formula, as we'll talk about later, helps prime Americans for an industrial palate, um, for that kind of acclimates them to enjoy even more than we're already hardwired to do so, to enjoy highly processed food that's um, got salt in it and sugar and kind of bland textures. Um, it, you know, infants after days of birth are being fed these kinds of food that only creates a pathway to um, it, being receptive to the, the industrial diet that we later um, have and continue to have. Okay, so the golden age is the 1950s where it just really becomes solidified. I mean, the, the use and increase in production and, in, and consumption of, of commercial baby food goes up and up through the 30s and 40s, but when we get to the post-war years, the baby boom years, logically, you get just incredible increases in production and consumption of commercial baby food. So like one year, you'll have a 20% increase in the amount of baby food purchased. Um, advertising is revealing interesting clues, I think, as to partly that production is going up because there's more kids out there, right? There's more babies with the baby boom. But part of the in increased consumption is going that babies is because babies are fed solids at earlier and earlier ages. And advertising is reflecting this slash trying to promote this, right? Promote the very early introduction of solids into a baby's diet. So we, you can't really read the text. And it, the text is interesting. But um, the, the interesting thing, I think, the most interesting thing are the visuals. And that these, the picture of this baby and the next ones I'll show you are so little, they can't really even hold their heads up. And 
probably to be able to eat, ingest food um, and not choke, you need to stand and be able to hold your head up and you need a swallowing reflex. Well, a baby at one to two months old doesn't really have a well-developed swallowing reflex and can't really hold her head up. And the text also indicates the tiniest babies enjoy Gerber's bananas. Um, and the pictures, you know, you know, again, reflects that baby lying down. Here's another one, a baby, you know, lying flat on her stomach, <laughs> ready for the next step. Um, you know, tiny babies love Gerber's and they're ready to move on. Um, this one says, let's see. Uh, Ready, all the ready for the next step, honey. Ready for something a little more solid in your diet, darling. When your daughter, doctor says the baby is all set for the next step, you'll find Gerber's most helpful. So the, the images are giving the, this idea, or promoting this idea that, that tiny babies are ready for solid foods, and, and the text is as well. Here's one, the baby is holding her head up, although she's kind of like leaning forward. But this is a clearly um, another promotion of solid food is that the dads can get in on the, um, in on the act. And indeed they could. When you, when you decouple infant feeding from breastfeeding and from um, in, into more commercial products, then it makes it more easy and convenient for other family members, other parents to um, enjoy it. And um, this one says, even tiny infants appreciate the smooth texture right from the start. And then here's another one, beech nut, um, promoting a beech nut fruit dessert. It says, um, babies simply love new beech nut fruit dessert. Um, it's fun to feed baby something he takes to at the very first taste. Um, really rings a bell with baby. Perfect texture, um, delicious. And again, the baby, you know, tiny baby lying down. These babies are probably two months old, I think, I guess I would say. And again, you know, this kind of idea that it, um, desserts would be appropriate for babies. And, you know, the, the, to the food manufacturer's defense, there's never an assumption that food has to be different um, from the food that is marketed to adults, there's, that, that the food should contain different things. And so if, a, if adults can enjoy tiny dessert, baby, you know, desserts, why shouldn't babies also enjoy desserts? But again, again, this early introduction of food. All of this baby food um, functions to change the landscape of supermarkets. So you have the development in this period, this is 1941, of development of baby food and baby centers and sectors of the supermarkets um, and representatives from the baby food that companies would offer to set up displays rotate the um, items um, have specials and uh, tasting and baby food contests you know so a whole culture a whole material culture develops over infant food um, and it slips into the landscape of grocery stores they become really important, and in 1948, um, a study found a study looked at um, the 10 largest American cities, and the most commonly purchased item in 1948 in the 10 largest American cities in grocery stores was baby food, and it it was double the next product which was evaporated milk, which is also used in infant formula, that a lot of um, formulas were evaporated milk mixed with corn syrup and um, a little cream. And so the top two products in the 10 largest American store, uh, cities are infant feeding products. So you can imagine the power that it had. And also marketers would, would pull out statistics that showed that women who bought baby food tended to spend the most in grocery stores and buy some of the most expensive items. So these were really valued customers that grocery stores didn't want to lose and they wanted to cater to. Um, very important. Here's another um, uh, aisle from 1953 in, in Delaware. And I was at the Beech Nut Archives and found a lot of the, the sales reps' um, materials and a lot of pictures of their displays and their uh, promotional packets. By 1962, it's, it's definitely entrenched 
into um, American mainstream culture. And there's enough baby food out there for each infant to consume 72 dozen jars in the first year of life. Now, we don't know if they're actually consuming that. That's the way the statistics are, are announced in Life magazine, that babies are consuming 72 dozen jars of baby food in the first year. We don't know that, but that's in the food supply. And, um, you know, there's probably other people who are eat, consuming that baby food. But that, nevertheless, that's a lot of baby food. Um, and this the, kind of 1969 is the, is the high water mark of commercial infant food, and um, breastfeeding levels are at their lowest. So there is an interesting correlation, as well as the statistics on formula feeding, too. Now, oh, this is interesting, too. So here's some labels from the 1960s. And again, we can't really read it. A very interesting, you know, um, upfront, um, unapologetic listing of the items that are in the baby food at this in this golden age of baby food. And again, you know, as these these baby food products develop, they want to them to sell, and they are prepared primarily with the um, mother's palate in mind. They are figuring that the mom is going to taste it, and if it tastes bland or if it tastes not good, then they're not going to purchase it. So the foods are prepared in the similar way that regular industrial canned products and processed products are. And no one kind of blinks an eye about that. That do it doesn't seem to be wrong. In fact, it seems to be smart marketing and smart food um, producing um, strategies until we get to the 1970s, right? When there's a whole reevaluation of, um, of the culture. You have a, you know, that backdrop that, that we know a lot about, um, the counterculture movement, reevaluating industry, reevaluating government, um, distrusting authority, the rise of the women's movement and um, civil rights movement, and um, a consumer movement that's pretty strong and pretty powerful. And the most visible person is Ralph Nader, who is testifying to Congress and writing books about how terrible American products are. And he attacks the food industry. The food industry is one of his targets. And he's testifying um, in front of the Senate um, Committee on Nutrition, full of very powerful senators, about the terrible state of our food supply and the lack of regulation on the part of the government. And baby food is part of this um, part of this element, part of this reevaluation. And all of a sudden, people kind of sit up and begin to think about food in this critical way, and think about baby food, the feeding of infants in this in this critical way. And so, some studies come on in the late '60s, early '70s that that understand breastfeeding is in decline and, and evaluate that. What is that may not be such a good thing. So, whereas all these products pre um, pre-late 1960s, early 70s are seen as positive and scientific and modern and convenient and um, better than homemade. That all kind of switches in this period. So studies showing breastfeeding in decline and documenting it and worrying about it is, is a central element. Medical studies come out showing that these additives and foods aren't necessarily good for infants I mean, uh, for adults, let alone infants. So one of the earliest is this I worry about MSG. Um, and it was never necessarily proved conclusive, but it wasn't so good for rats. So probably it's not so good for humans as well. Mon uh, monosodium glutamate. Also, modified starch is an element, too, that's criticized. And they begin to look at the jars of baby food with a significant amount of modified starch. It's called tapioca, too. And you know that's displacing. It's cheap starch. It's a cheap filler that's displacing more nutritional elements in the baby food. So that raises an eyebrow as well. Um, they start to be aware of kind of the increased amount of salt that infants are receiving it between artificial formula, baby formula, and baby foods. And so um, Jean Mayer, who's a nutritionist at Harvard, writes a column that's run in a lot of newspapers. And he's saying, you know, if a baby is having, is being bottle fed and 
eating a lot of baby food, they're getting 10 times the amount of sodium than they should. And what is that doing to, you know, set in, in motion, you know, future health effects down the road? Um, sugar as well, you know, looking at the amount of sugar that is in these products and studies that are um, showing the excess in, in consumption of, of empty calories ends up de being decreased nutrition and leading to possible problems down the road. Nitrates, nitrates are also found in baby food, and that's from artificial fertilizers that have run off the soil and stayed in the products. Then there becomes to be more conclusive studies on early solid feeding, that it's probably not a good idea, that infants' physiology is not um, uh, conducive to early feeding, and that you know, more studies on breast milk are showing that breast milk is probably a pretty good substance for, for infants zero to six months, and it's probably the best stuff that they could um, be consuming at that time, and anything else is taking away in some ways from their nutrition. There's also critics of international advertising and marketing, not just, crit uh, not just marketing to parents in the United States, but there's a parallel story going on about um, Nestle and the international marketing of formula um, in developing countries, which is causing a lot of harm for um, women and infants in, in other countries. So th those two kind of c come together and create a stronger critique of commercial infant food. And then there's critics of baby food labeling, and there's really interesting discussions that are going on out there. And, th and consumer activists are criticizing the government for not requiring that baby food companies list the percentage of ingredients in their, on, the, on their labels. So for the, the butter, the, the carrots in butter sauce, they listed all the ingredients, but they didn't tell us the percentage of each one. So, you know, given the, the brown sugar and the sugar and the, you know, it could, that could be a fairly hefty um, percentage of um, calories and um, the bulk of food, the, you know, who knows how much modified starch is, is in, in the jar. And in the meantime, pet food is, there are requirements um, requiring pet food to be labeled in this way. So there's all of this, you know, outcry. Why do we make um, pet met food manufacturers list the percentage of ingredients on their label and we don't do it for baby food labeling and ingredients? Um, here's just some examples of some articles that, that are coming out um, bringing up these issues. So this is 1974. This is 1973. nineteen eighty, there is no nutritional advantage in introducing solid foods to baby too early, according to a report published in an issue of Nutrition and the MD, a newsletter for f physicians. So this gets the stamp of official um, uh, legitimacy if it's going to the physicians in the physician newsletter. So the alternative, what is happening um, on, on the opposite side. Um, so people are saying, well, maybe we, we don't want to use commercial baby food. And in the 1970s and 80s, you have kind of the first wave of this DIY um, make your own baby food, uh, which is what it was in the, originally before commercial baby food. Um, but we're having, it, it's called homemade and it's called you know, a, new, uh, a new aspect of it. It's easier this time around because there's more suitable technology than just kind of taking cooked vegetables and mashing them through a colander. Um, there's, blenders are now a common household implement. Um, when you get the rise of the Cuisinart in the 1980s, that becomes another baby food um, item. Um, freezers, most Americans have freezers in their homes. And then the rise of plastic becomes a big one if you think about it. So those plastic containers, pl uh, plastic bags, all of that become important for people who want to make baby food and freeze it as a convenient way to, to feed their children. And in the beginning, you know, you didn't have those kinds of technologies. But, but it's interesting to think about as an example of how baby food makes its way into um, the landscape of middle America is to think about those glass jars of, of 
uh, baby food that that Ivy the the advertisement. But so I thought so well um, illustrates that so they become a really important cultural icon. Um, they're used in everything from craft projects to storing glitter to um, nails in tool shops. Um, they're great vases. Kids make them in crafts projects. Um, they just really become embedded into mainstream American culture. Um, food famine relief efforts from the 1950s on, all the reports of you know, America, the United States sending food aid abroad always mentions the number of cases of baby food that are going to Ethiopia or going to Greece or the flood-stricken areas. Um, the c cases of baby food were one of the few items led into the, um, the uprising at Wounded Knee in 1973 when the Native Americans were, were protesting conditions and the government's, US government set up a blockade and wouldn't let things go in. But one of the, I think the two things they did let go in were baby food, which is pretty interesting. So it definitely is this cultural marker so they're suitable technology for, for, um, for al alternative homemade baby food to be um, possible. Um, there's also wild inflation in the early 1970s, right? And so um, it's seen as an economic alternative. It's also given all the, publicity, the bad publicity about additives and possible pro problems. It's seen as something that could be more healthy and a safer alternative. And it's also couched in, the reports about it are couched in kind of a, it's seen as a quasi-feminist activity. It's, it's stay-at-home mothers who are usually doing it, that the newspaper articles are featuring them, but it's kind of seen as an act of independence or an act of defiance and, and kind of going against um, uh, corporate capitalism, conventional corporate capitalism. And, and in an earlier period, kind of the idea of making your own baby food was really seen as more suspect and um, anti-American. I've seen... Um, documents, the National Archives talking about Adele Davis, who was an early, early nutritionist who advocated, you know, eschewing commercial, commercial products and making your own, um, you know, kind of being described as a socialist and we need to check on her and she's coming to New Hampshire, we need to, you know, we should worry about that. So this idea somehow of alternative baby food was seen as suspect, but in the 1970s it, it gains a kind of a more respectable um, patina. Um, and there's a whole bunch of cookbooks that come out a, as a result. You get a lot of people, it's often women, who um, want uh, an alternative to commercial baby food, and then they become entrepreneurial and create their own cookbook as a result um, with lots of recipes. And here's just an example of a, you know, highlighting a, a woman, one of them who wrote one of those cookbooks, how it just came out of this, well, I just wanted a, another alternative, it's cheaper, um, I think her husband's a firefighter, you know, kind of a, a, a very mainstream um, activity. And there's classes, the Red Cross uh, offers classes in making your own baby food, so it really kind of reaches a, a a mainstream status, but the baby food industry is not happy about it. They see it as a real threat um, and see it as something that could um, put their business in danger. And you have a really interesting episode. This is 1976, I believe, when the Beech Nut Company um, sends a letter to a quarter of a million women who just had babies. So, the, and the, the companies can do this. They can get the, the names and addresses from the hospitals, and they often would send out, you know, infant formula or baby food products or souvenir spoons, you know, well, congratulations on your baby. Well, this one was a letter that was sent out warning um, mothers of the dangers of homemade baby food, that if not pre prepared, um, prepared, perfectly could danger your baby, could be unhealthful, and could result in a type of anemia called um, mega, let me find the word. Methemglobinemia, which is a very, very rare form of anemia that comes from excess of nitrites, that usually from beets and um, carrots, and that it was warning them that that could be a potential. Well, at that point, the, 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 the 
discourse had changed enough for there to really be an outrage at Beechnut over this letter that went out. And there was really an uproar. The American Medi Medical Association wrote a letter condemning Beechnut. Consumer Affairs Bureaus were um, up outraged. Um, some women sued Beechnut over this, and they eventually settled out of court. And one of the things that Beechnut had to do was send a letter to another quarter of a million women um, telling them that baby food, homemade baby food was indeed safe and nutritious if prepared properly. But I think it really ex it shows the intensity and the threat on the part of the industrial commercial baby food makers that, that this um, homemade movement had. Um, the, the president of Beechnut apologized and said I, we didn't realize how um, important this was to women and how important it was to take out these additives and indeed started taking out the sugar and the salt out of its, out of its um, products. Gerber was reluctant because Gerber was always the, had the biggest march market share. At this point, it has like 60% of market share. So it doesn't feel like it needs to take it out. But it does say that they would probably discontinue a couple of their baby food desserts, um, blueberry buckle and raspberry cobbler. And he, the, Z, the CEO comments, we never said that they were particularly nutritious. Sorry, we never said they were particularly nutritious or that they were bad for you either. We just said they tasted good. So sort of responding to this pressure, um, but eventually it too does respond. And industry um, does respond to consumer uh, demand and removes somewhat slowly, but, it, but does remove MSG, salt, sugar, and eventually feels the the threat of, uh, of the new alternative products, particularly organic products, that it's, it, start, it too starts its own line of organics in the 90s, usually. Um, and again, you know, it, this was a wake-up call to the manufacturers. There was no, before the, the consumer movement, before the 1970s, there was no thought that there had to be cleaner food for babies than, than were for um, adults. And so this whole conversation about infant food really takes on a new level. At the same time, another response is that the, the medical community is ratcheting forward the, uh, the recommended age of introducing solids. And it's really interesting to read the medical discourse over early introduction of solids because the doctors are really divided. And so in the 1950s, the AMA does this huge study. It pulls all of their doctors, what a, you know, very thorough, when do you fee, recommend introduction of solids? And you know, lots of statistics, lots of qualitative comments, and there seems to be a divide in generations between the old, older doctors and the younger doctors. The older doctors, um, who probably came of age and practiced in the 20s and 30s, were very reluctant to introduce solids early. They just felt like there wasn't enough evidence to have such early introduction. The younger doctors were, well, you know, the women are going to do it anyway. They're all competing with each other, and you know, w w there's nothing really bad about it. We can't really find anything bad about it. Um, but these studies that, that start to show um, conclusive evidence that it might not be such a great thing creates um, the AMA and the Amer uh, Pediatric Association to try to set up some standards of introduction of solids. And before the, the, the rule was four to six weeks, that's when doctors recommended the introduction of solids. And then in the 19, early 1970s, it moves to about two to three months of age, that that's their formal recommendation. Then it goes to four and eventually settles in between four to six months um, where it is now. So homemade, as we know, grows, continues, and continues into the 80s and the 90s and goes artisanal and goes commodified and like good um, what, what America does well, which is take products and commodify them and create niche markets. So we have um, a kind of a stunning array of uh, options for homemade baby food. And if you go into William Sonoma, you can see you know $200 baby food makers. Um, so they've done a good job taking that and, and running with it. 
But through this all, through all of this shift and change, baby food, commercial baby food numbers remain solid and even increase. And they just go up and up and up. Um, and they continue to go up in the 1980s and 90s, in part because the baby food makers responded to um, you know, getting the bad stuff out of the baby, baby food, but also because of the number of two um, parent families increases and the number of women with small children increases through the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And so the product, as long as there is some level of um, disp disposable income and there's two parents working, commercial baby food uh, becomes you know, more popular than ever as a time-saving and convenience method. So just two concluding thoughts in this whole kind of trajectory. And the first is, it doesn't matter the time period. It doesn't matter what the advice is, what the practice is. It doesn't matter if it's late introduction, if it doesn't matter if it's early introduction, it doesn't matter if it's breastfeeding, it doesn't matter if it's formula feeding, solid feeding. It's all about anxiety. <laughs> and this comes up in the literature time and time again, that there is so much import placed on feeding one's infant, especially for mothers. And this is logical, obviously, but there are so, there are so many places where it is coming at a woman, from the medical community, from advertising, from uh, convention, from self-inflicted uh, you know, aspiration, that each era is that, that, that the practice and the advice shifts, but the anxiety remains, which is really just interesting. And um, I, I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. And then the second is this notion of acculturation and taste, um, especially as we are in the middle of the good food movement, where we are sh thinking about an alternative to industrial food, and we're trying to figure out food that is both healthier for us and healthier on the environment. Um, how is that movement, um, where is it vis-a-vis -vis the industrialized, industrialized palate that we've developed, that Americans have developed since birth? Um, I think in 1988, a study sh came out, showed that 90% of Americans not only had baby food, grew up on commercial baby food, but grew up on Gerber baby food. So, I mean, just this kind of indelible element of culture. And if, if infants, it, you know, within weeks after birth are um, being fed products that are bland in texture, um, in the case of, I mean, baby food and formula is kind of cleaned up, but but industrialized food that is in the mid 20th century, say, that's 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 processed, that's got salt, sugar, um, all of these kinds of elements that that are helping prime our industrial palate. You know, we're hardwired to crave and enjoy foods high in fat and sugar and salt. But one of the things I'm trying to think about is how the early introduction of baby food kind of primes that palate, the industrial palate, and how so many Americans are acclimated to industrial food and like that taste and prefer that taste, and how does that mesh or not with this idea of fresher, um, seasonal food that's a very different taste um, palate, taste profile, from industrialized food, and how how is that going to work out? So that is my presentation. Those are my thoughts, and I would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you.